Mishka Shabali is catching up with friends who are arguably more talented than him. Man, I really don't know how to go into this. Uh, I guess uh, you just begin. Um, Today is the one-year anniversary of Mark Lanigan's death, and uh, it feels a little macabre, but I'm going to do something. I don't know yet what it is. Uh, I'm going to talk. I'm going to try and talk, just sort of talk off the top of my head uh, for an hour or so um, about my friend and specifically about my relationship with him, my experience of him. Um, uh, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to expose his secrets, but um, I want to talk about the effect that he had on my life and uh, what the last year has been like uh, to be uh, grieving and mourning such a such a legendary figure, such a larger than life person, a uh, a once in a lifetime artist, a once in a lifetime friend. The Amongst his friends, you know, I mean, the I feel like Lanigan had a pretty erudite, um, articulate crew, and you'll find us all sort of uh, stuttering and stammering to try to, um, to try to articulate what kind of person he was, what kind of artist he was, because uh, he was, uh, he was everything. He was all of them, and he sort of exceeded any narrow word that we have to, to slot. Uh, an intellect or a um, a heart, a presence, a brain um, into one c- category or another. He was um, he was a poet. He was a memoirist. He was learning to be a fiction writer. Um, he obviously he was a songwriter. One of the one of the greatest voices of our time. Uh, uh, his editor at DeCapo, Ben Schaefer. Um, said, you know, Frank Sinatra, Nina Simone, Mark Lanigan. Um, and, and I agree with that. Um, he was an interpreter of songs. Uh, he, you know, he performed so many songs that, uh, that I thought were his songs and they absolutely were his songs with his performance of them. Um, but, uh, they just happened to be written by other people. Uh, he was also, he was a collaborator. Um, and he, uh, he loved collaborating. He loved working with other people. He really seemed to be energized by connecting with other artists. And the uh, the conflict that might arise there. Um, so I guess let me formally open with an apology. Uh, I opened the iMovie app on my computer. Um, and I guess the last time that I used that uh, was the last time that I recorded uh, something about Lanigan, which was uh, 364 days ago. And looking at it, I am similarly unkempt and my room is uh, still fucked up. And there's, uh, I feel like that uh, Tascam 38 uh, eight track machine has not moved an inch uh, since the last video. So, so uh, I, I apologize that my and my room is a mess, that I'm a mess. Uh, I gave myself a haircut yesterday. I got some of them, uh, but uh, whatever, it is what it is. Fuck it. We're just going to, we're just going to go for it. Um, I, I sort of put a call out to uh, folks on the internet, um, on Twitter and Facebook and Reddit um, for uh, questions about Lanigan and, um, that maybe they wanted answered that I can, uh, I can answer or try to answer or gesture at answering or, uh, or just, uh, slip out of them. Um, but I'm going to go through some of those. Um, someone said, Chris said, I think he was planning on writing another book, a mixture of fact and fiction. Were you involved in this? Um, yeah, we had talked about, um, you know, we made jokes the whole time that we were working on Sing Backwards and Weep that um, 
you know, that there would be no sequel. And, and because, you know, we were clear that there was not going to be a sequel. Um, that's all we joked about. And, you know, it was, um, you know, uh, sing backwards or and weepier to electric boogaloo, um, you know, and every, but he was adamant that this, this was it, you know, sort of one and done. And, um, but we're addicts. If we're anything, we're recidivists, and we go back on our word. And the after the success of Sing Backwards and Weep, um, I was like, Mark, you know, I know you said that you, you know that this was it for you, um, but uh, but you know, let's talk. And um, we we talked about auto fiction, like the work of uh, of Charles Bukowski and Lucia Berlin, um, and a couple others, where it's um, it draws elements of autobiography and fiction. Um, we talked about The Painted Bird by Jerzy Kaczynski, uh, heartbreaking, uh, uh, stag- a heartbreaking work of staggering genius by Dave Eggers. Um, sort of uh, memoir plus like that, where the writer is incorporating elements of fact and fiction to hopefully deliver a narrative that's truer than, um, you know, than a story that's, uh, that is just, just the facts. Um, Mark was adamant about the timeline for sing backwards and weep because, um, because of people in his life who he cared about, who he didn't want to hurt. You know, he wanted to, I'm going to say he wanted to tell his story. He didn't want to tell his story. Uh, we we uh, we nagged him and pushed him and cajoled him and forced him um, uh, to tell the story. Um, but he he chose a timeline that that protected people around him that he felt would be hurt by um, you know him telling the, the, the true story of what happened sort of after that. Um, and, you know, Courtney Love putting him in rehab and him, you know, really finally coming to terms with, um, with his addiction and making the decision to quit. Um, uh, that was, it was sort of a natural bookend. Um, I remember, you know, talking and some of these stories I've told before, but fuck it, I'm going to tell it again. Um, the, you know, we were talking in his backyard one day and he said, you know, well, I'm definitely not going to put this story in the book, but, um, but this is a good one. Um, and he told me the story of, uh, of Courtney putting him in rehab and then him having this sort of like religious epiphany. Um, the, uh, just a lightning bolt from God that basically that he knew that he was, a, um, he knew that he was an addict and he knew that he had to change and, uh, just sort of like falling to his knees, you know, um, and, you know, and begging God to, to help him. And, uh, when he finished telling the story, I was like, Mark, the, are you kidding? You know, the, uh, it, it, that's a fucking brilliant story. The, um, it's not just going to be in the book. That's the ending of the book. That's how it ends right there, you know? And, and he was like, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't know about that. Um, and, uh, I was like, that's, no, it's so tremendous. Like you just had that epiphany and then you stopped. And he was like, Oh God, no, I, I was, I ended up having to go back to that rehab so many times, you know, that they finally, they kicked me out. And then, you know, the, and then there was meth after that. And the, but that's when, that's when I, that's when I changed. That's when the change happened. That's, I think that's when he saw himself as he had that moment of recognition and the, um, you know, he definitely had other misadventures, uh, with other chemicals and, um, you know, and he, he did use heroin again, but, but not the way that he had where, um, it just carved, you know, had carved the humanity out of him. The, you know, there's that line in, uh, Bad Lieutenant uh, by Zoe Lund, you know, where she talks about um, the we're vampires, you know, that um, appetite pushes everything else out until we're just that need, just that craving. And I think that um, that first bout of, re- or, you know, of rehab, that's where Mark recognized that um, that he had to turn and fight, you know, 
uh, he, he saw himself and he couldn't unsee himself in that moment. Um, so we, um, we had been working on another book, the, which I had pitched him a couple of different ideas of, um, how to, uh, how to tell the next story. And I, and he wanted to write a novel and, and I was like, no, the, um, we love you for who you are and for all the things that you've done, the mistakes that you've made, the art that you've made, your humanity. And there's something about nonfiction. I mean, we, we want the true shit, you know, we want, we want the real and, um, and we all loved, you know, Mark's creative output. And, um, but there's, there's nothing like a memoir. You know, we wanted the straight dope from him. And so I said, um, let's do he was adamant no more nonfiction, no more more memoir he wanted to write a, a novel and i said let's do uh let's the book is called methamphetamine blues and it's just structured as a love story to uh to a drug and that's the book you know those are the bookends and the um and we'll structure it like uh, Derek C. in France, uh, brilliant movie, Blue Valentine, where it's um, it's sort of told in reverse, you know, and the the last scene of the book is um, him using meth for the first time and being like, oh, this is really going to work out for me, which I think as addicts, we've um, we've all made that mistake, mistake with different drugs. Um, this is going to be the one that's going to work out, you know. Um, and we, so we went back and forth about that for a while and then lost the thread somehow. And then he was, we bickered about this for, you know, a while, but then I came up with another, um, another idea of doing a book sort of like Jesus son, where he could, uh, change the names and identities and, um, and basically, um, tell tell the truth tell a true story but present it as fiction um and that would provide sort of a layer of buffer for the other people around him in his life you know to protect them to shelter them um i do feel that it is the obligation of a memoirist to reveal their own secrets and to protect the secrets of others um so i i said oh okay the book will be called mark lanigan is dead and it'll be like, uh, like Jesus son or like, uh, you know, the painted bird by Jersey Kaczynski. And, um, it will be, uh, and I think we came up with a fictional memoir is what it was going to be called. Um, and yeah, the working title for that was Mark Lanigan is dead, which he loved, uh, you know, and it feels awfully macabre now, but, um, that device, I think would have freed him up to tell a lot of the stories that he was reluctant to tell, um, because his life got, you know, so ugly and so convoluted, but, um, you know, we did make some progress on that and then it sort of fell by the wayside. And then he had, there was another piece of fiction that he was working on. Uh, it was about a, uh, a catalytic converter thief living in Los Angeles. And, uh, while we were working on this, somebody stole the catalytic, uh, catalytic converter off my car. And, uh, and he immediately tweaked me about it on Twitter. And he was like, bro, the, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, it was just, it was right there. I had to help myself. Um, and that was promising the, I, but you know, I have to say, I don't think it was another sing backwards and weep. I mean, there, there is something about, uh, fiction is made up. It's lies, right? It's not real. Memoir is real. And sing backwards and weep was totally real. And Mark Lanigan was the realest motherfucker you ever met. Um, and his, his voice, his presence, his consciousness was, um, it was nonfiction. He, you know, he walked right out of a film noir 
detective fiction, you know, the cloud of smoke and then emerging from the shadows, you know, that was, that was absolutely Lanigan. And I, I think that he was perfectly suited to, you know, the, the grittiness of, um, of the real. And I don't know, I wasn't particularly supportive of, of him writing a novel because I felt like for his career, it would be sort of starting over again from the bottom. Um, Let me look at another question here. The um, what was it? my my friend John? Uh, what was your favorite day slash weekend slash cup of coffee slash conversation with him? Outside of his music, what made him special to you? Uh, you know, Lanigan had a um, you know had developed a palette for the dark, the depraved, the degenerate. Um, so there were, uh, stories from my own life that I didn't feel comfortable sharing with, um, with other people. Um, you know, I had secrets that I told him and that I, that I only told Mark and when I, you know, when I take my dog to the dog park, um, sometimes, or, you know, if I'm taking her for a walk in the woods, uh, I'll see her sort of like stop and smell something. And then she lies down on her back and she does this like scritching dance, you know, in the, um, in the leaves or in the grass and with just this, uh, sort of ear to ear grin on her face and, um, just sort of like pure carnal delight. And what it means is that she's found something like fucking dead and rotting and she's going to roll in it. And she just has this like look of glee on her face. And whenever I told Lanigan, a, a particularly fucked up deranged story from my own life, the, he, his face just lit up the, I mean, you know, he would be sort of stone faced throughout the telling. And then at a certain point, his, uh, his eyes would light up and he would just cackle. <laughs> and, uh, you know, particularly when a story involved, uh, my humiliation or, you know, me getting, uh, me getting owned one way or another. Um, you know, I told him, um, one of the one of the first or the, or the first time that I met him at his house, I told him the story of uh, getting shipwrecked and making the you know walking forever in the hot sun and making the decision to uh, to drink my own urine and then getting rescued uh, five minutes later, and the he like just took a drag off his cigarette and then he breathed out and he was like, "You drink your own piss," and I was like, "Yeah." And he just hooted <laughs> and just like the, like I, I'm sort of reaching for old fashioned words for happiness to describe the, the purity mirth, <laughs> right? He was his, uh, his chest filled with mirth. He was so, it just brought him, my suffering brought him so much happiness. Um, the, and you know, so I, there's a, I have a lot of like happy moments with him. Um, and another one was, uh, was meeting Greg Dooley for the first time in Lanigan's backyard. And, uh, he, he was like, Oh, Greg, this is Mishka. And, and Greg was like, Oh, Hey, hi. Yeah. You know, nice to meet you. And the, and it was clear that Lanigan had mentioned my name to him and that, um, that I wasn't sort of there on a day pass, you know, that, um, he had accepted me into his circle of friends and collaborators and the, uh, and that touched me and it still touches me. You know, I mean, I think part of my fascination with Lanigan, um, and, uh, one of the things that I deal with my own writing and with my therapist, um, is this desire to be cool. We all want to be cool. Um, we all want very much to be cool. And Lanigan was the coolest motherfucker ever. And uh, I definitely felt cooler in his presence. Uh, I feel cool for having known him and having worked with him. And, um, and he knew that. And 
I think he was very careful to always uh, treat me as a as a peer or as an equal. You know, if I sent him a song, he wouldn't just rip it up immediately. He would j usually say something kind, and then he would say, you know, do you want my criticism on this? You know, and then he would rip it up. And uh, he sent me a song once, and I was like, do you want my? And he said, no. <laughs> he was like. I, I'm grateful for your gifts, you know, when it uh, when it comes to like writing and editing the book, and when it comes to songs, I got this, you know. The he he knew what he was doing, and he knew that he knew what he was doing, um, you know. But there were a lot of like, I don't know, just just funny moments with him. Um, he was he was dark, Mark. You know, I mean, he was he was a very craggy dude, and. There were times where it was clear that he was sort of up to his eyes in his own pain or, and you know, he was pretty mercurial. He could fly off the handle pretty easily and, uh, it made it, it made it that much more rewarding to get a, a laugh out of him or a smile out of him. Oh, one thing I want to say the, um, before I forget the, there's a new book out about Lanigan, um, that I, I looked at, I'm not going to read it. Um, and uh, it feels, uh, in poor form to sort of trash, uh, another writer without having read their work, but here's why I'm not going to read it. Um, the, it's fucking overpriced. <laughs> He's selling it for more than, than Sing Backwards and Wheat, than Lanigan's own memoir. Um, the, as far as writing resumes go, this guy is a sausage maker. If you look at the other books that he's read, it's all like the grunge years or, you know, the um, Soundgarden off the record or whatever. The You know, he sort of clearly found his niche um, of, I don't know, packaging up the scraps. That's what it seems like. Don't get me wrong. You know, Please Kill Me is an amazing book. And, you know, they're the sort of um, oral histories of... Of punk rock and and hardcore, I'm thinking of Steve Blush's book. The you know, there's some phenomenal writing there and ph phenomenal reporting. The nothing about this. The, I don't see any arrows in that direction. Um, I, this doesn't seem to be a promising work. The and one of the um, guys carefully released it uh, the day before or the day of the anniversary of Lanigan's death, which is you know that he, he plans on sort of riding the wave of. Um, publicity and, you know, hopefully sort of getting the book in front of the eyes of, uh, you know, curious folks. And, um, and I feel like I'm doing something similar. Um, but in my defense, I didn't plan on doing anything, uh, for the anniversary of, of Lanigan's passing. I just, uh, woke up this morning before my alarm went off. I was sad. I thought about my friend Roberto. I thought about Ben Schaefer. I thought about how a bunch of us were sort of uh, grieving uh, alone together today and had a bunch of feelings today. And I was like, fuck it. I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to sit down and talk it out. Um, also, this conversation doesn't cost 50 bucks. Like, come on. Um, the and then the other thing is this guy who wrote this book, uh, that guy whose name I'm not going to repeat, a book whose title I'm not going to repeat. Uh, he's publishing articles that he's written about the book on like kind of bullshit websites, and that's a real bad look. It just it just looks corny when you're um, you, you were all hucksters, we're all grifters, we're all trying to get people's attention and the hearts and the likes and get people's eyes on our work but um the um nothing about this project this project points to it having any kind of artistic merit um i i know that a lot of flanagan's oldest friends and closest friends uh, spoke to this writer and i cast no aspersions on them the um we it's our job just to mourn and grieve um and um, you know, and I think that's what they were doing. Um, I don't know. Maybe the book's great. I'll never find out. <laughs> Look at another question here. From 
Jake uh, just heard today that he helped write Something in the Way by Nirvana. Is that true, and how did that come about? Uh, I'm not going to tackle this question, and here's why. The um, I'm a Lanigan fan. I was... Um, I was a Nirvana fan when I was a kid, and uh, I still rock out to it when it comes on the radio. But um, uh, Lanigan is what I'm here for, not who he knows or um, you know who he, uh, who his friends were. Or um, the media always wanted to; they always wanted Lanigan's story to be about uh, his friendship with Lane, his friendship with Kurt. The those were his real friends. Those were people he loved and artists he admired, and they were his buddies. And um, I think it's hard for us as as normals to um, to perceive Lane or uh, Kurt as real people who had real friends. But um, but Lanigan was adamant that his uh, he was going to succeed or fail on his own merits. You know, um, Kurt invited him to do. Uh, the MTV Unplugged show and Lanigan declined. Um, it was for better and for worse. It was his way or the highway. Um, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go into that question. I I don't think it's germane to our conversation of Lanigan as an artist and what he uh, what he achieved as a musician, as a songwriter, as a writer. Um, to to have him be like a plus one for um, a, a, a more famous friend or more successful friend, the I just I just want to talk about him in in his own light and, um, and what he did, and also you know the I want I want to talk about my relationship with him, my experience of you know. Uh, you know, they say, don't tweet your heroes. <laughs> um, and I did, and man, what a fucking ride it's been. <clears throat> the, also, I, I don't blame people for their curiosity, the, but, um, you know, about his affiliations with Nirvana, I'm just not going to answer that stuff. Um, message from Chris. My question is, how did you get to know him when supposedly he could be a hard guy to approach? Was it as simple as you made it sound during your eulogy podcast when he passed, or was there more to it? Uh, I don't remember exactly what I said, but the um, it was... I mean, I think... Let me back up here. I'm constantly... Um, I went to uh, Columbia Graduate School in New York. I still have over $100,000 in student loans that I owe. Um, I'm, I teach writing now constantly in touch with students um talking about graduate school is it worth it is it not worth it um is you know is is that money that's well spent i i don't know um i went to graduate school i guess i made it as a writer um but i don't i don't have a control group i can't say what i would or would have you know would or wouldn't have done if i hadn't gone to columbia so um I succeeded. I found some success as a writer. Also, I went to graduate school. I don't know how much those two are related. Um, the my connection with Lanigan came directly out of my writing. I wrote a piece uh, called uh, "1500 Words That Won't Tell You What Bubblegum Sounds Like," and tweeted that to him. And I, I still feel like. I don't know, something was with me that day when I wrote it. Uh, I'm still, you know, I still feel really proud of that work. And it resonated with Mark. You know, I mean, I think he'd read a lot of writing about his music, um, some of which he loved and some of which he hated. Um, and he wasn't afraid to sort of spar with journalists. Um, the, But I, I think my writing resonated with him and that he felt like I'd gotten it right. Um, enough that he was willing to give me his address uh, so I could send him a copy of my memoir. And then I, I stalked him and sort of followed up um, with him about that. And finally he did, you know, sort of sit down and read it. And I mean, it sounds like I'm tooting my own horn here, but I mean, this is honestly how I feel like it, un 
you know, it evolved that the, the writing was good enough that um, he was open to being friends with me. Um, it wasn't, you know, I've talked to a lot of people who met him at shows and, and stuff. Um, I actually never saw him perform live, which kills me. But um, I've talked to a lot of people who who met him at shows and he could alternately be um, really friendly, really outgoing or really standoffish. Um, but my connection with him was through was through writing. Um, and I think that's how I, how I made it through, how I, you know, reached out, how I got to him. Um, yeah. Um, Lila says, hi, Lila, one of my ex students, uh, anything you can share about the writing process for sing backwards and weep and how he felt about it after it was published. Um, yeah, the, uh, we, you know, basically I nagged him to, to tell a story, to, to write enough, um, that we could give to Ben Schaefer at DeCapo to sort of prove to him that Lanigan was, uh, willing to write a book. And then Ben went and got us as much money as he could. And the, uh, and then I thought I was just getting Mark the deal. I didn't realize that like I was going to be coming along for the ride. So I, I did the, I did the proposal. I made the proposal happen. And, um, and then when we got the deal, I was sort of like, all right, man, you know, you did it. Awesome. And he was like, no, are you fucking kidding me that no, you're, you're coming along with me on this ride. You're doing this too. And, uh, like immediately after we got the, the book deal, uh, Anthony Bourdain passed and I know Mark was devastated and he went sort of right into the studio, um, you know, as he was grieving and I, and I was on tour in the UK, I was going through my own shit. I'd just broken up with a girlfriend and I was sort of like, how are we going to make this work? You know, how's this going to happen? And I was actually, I was, uh, I did not have a place, um, like a home residence for five months that year. And so I was just bouncing around and, and he sent me like all this shit. And, uh, it was, it wasn't bad. It was just like really disorganized and didn't adhere to the rules of linear storytelling. Um, and I've been living out of this two tone 1976 Chevy van and I splurged and bought myself a hotel room for like two days and went and just sat there and tried to like wade through all this shit that he was sending me. And I was really depressed and stressed about it because, uh, it took forever to get through that first 10 pages. Like it took so much sort of, uh, restructuring and this goes here and this goes there. And then you gotta make the connective tissue between there. And, um, and I was, I was like, if this is what the book is going to be like, this is going to be a nightmare. Um, and, but Lanigan was so smart. I mean, he really was a genius period. Um, that, you know, when I gave it back to him and I was like, it, it needs to unfold like this. Um, we, we fought because we fought about everything. And then, um, and then he got it, you know, I mean, he was the, he was, he was such a, a sharp guy and has such intensity of focus. And he cared so much about art. He wanted it to be right. You know, that was very important to him that, uh, you know, I think the first couple of rounds, I sort of pulled my punches and, you know, didn't really go hard on the samples that he'd sent. And he called me out on it and was like, come on, bro. Like the, I know this isn't perfect. Uh, you know, you've got to really give it to me. And I, so, you know, eventually I learned to, um, but yeah, so it was really scattered at first and it took a lot of, um, cutting and pasting and editing to sort of put it together. Um, but then he just learned so fast that by, you know, the last couple of chapters, I was doing very minimal things to, uh, you know, catching typos, grammatical errors, um, the, oh, you know, and, and suggestions, um, 
can we reword this or you know this is unclear or maybe moving phrases around in in you know in sentences um that was a long weird winter to be doing the book with him he worked tremendously fast i mean he would just I, he just he <clears throat> I knew that he wouldn't write the book without a contract. So we got him a contract and then he was under contract and he had to deliver it. And uh, it's like they, they sent him the money and then, you know, money gets spent and then you have to do the fucking work. And uh, so he just, sometimes the fastest way to get through hell is just to go right through the center of it. And so he would just sort of sit down for like 12 hours um, and just go to war. Uh, and I would get a chapter and be like, fuck, I got to get through this. And then I would stay up late and get through it. And the next morning there would be another one and another one and another one. And it was just relentless. Um, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I mean, we turned that book in early and I got a call from Ben Schaefer and I was like, oh no, the, this can't be good. You know, the, and he was like, I don't know what to say. And I was like, ah, I'm so sorry. And he was like, the, this book is like, it's done. It's ready to go. You know, he, um, he was like, I can't, I can't believe how, how clean this is, how, how ready it is. Um, so that's, um, I don't know. That's the process. How, and how did Lanigan feel about it after it published? Man, this is really hard because I, I really promised him the moon when we were writing this book, you know, I was like, I know that I'm asking you to sort of like go back into the graveyard and like dig up all these bodies and the, that's going to suck and be really hard and really traumatic to sort of, um, have frank conversations, you know, with these ghosts. But then the, the end result is, you know, the, that they're given a proper burial and that, you know, when you enter them, um, that you're released and you're able to move on, you know, and I promised him that there would be catharsis and that he would feel, um, he would feel better. He would feel lighter. He would feel a release afterwards. And the, and he fucking harangued me after the book published where he was like the bro, you said I would feel better and I just feel worse. I was like, God damn it, Mark, you're killing me. However, um, I've spoken to a couple of other of his, you know, close friends and the, they've assured me that he wouldn't admit to me that he had gotten any relief from publishing, having the book finished and having it done and, and the, you know, the response that it had gotten, but to them, he was able to, to, to come clean and tell them that yes, that he did get, you know, some, some relief from it. Um, there was some catharsis, you know. The Colin Galitko, this one just popped up. The um, what's an album you'd recommend to a new listener? Um, I I think the uh, I think the the best way, the fastest way into Lanigan's work is uh, Bubblegum, or uh, oh my God, why am I blanking on it? Blues Funeral. Um, those are two records that stand out to me. Um, he, he covered a lot of ground as an artist. He covered a tremendous amount of ground. Um, but those are, I would say that's the, the gateway drug to, uh, to Mark Lanigan's music. The, those, those will sort of, uh, grab you by the lapels and throw you on board the Lanigan train from, from which you may never emerge. Um, couple more questions here from Gregorio uh, despite saying he never would do you think Mark would have eventually written another book about the second part of his life I I don't know I hope so the uh, you know when when I first met up with him to to talk about the book and to sort of take notes and stuff I brought him um I brought him some books. I brought him a book of poetry. Uh, I think it's called uh, Crow with No Mouth by Ikkyu, uh, 15th century Japanese uh, warrior monk. And um, I brought him that. I brought him Jesus' Son, which I think he'd already read. Uh, I think I brought him some other books. Um, but he... 
writing woke you know woke something up in him the you know i mean obviously he'd been writing you know since he was a young man but uh he'd never like tried to write and a long narrative like that and i think that despite his protestations to the contrary that eventually he did uh fall in love with writing and um you know to have this sort of new new form of expression um i think most writers would say they would that if they could write music and write songs they would do that instead because i i I, there is something magical and bewitching about a song but lanigan had written a million songs and i think um he really the experience of writing sing backwards and weep uh it made him a writer he he stared so long and so hard at that blank page and at the words on the page that he became a writer in the process of writing that book and i think he would have written a lot um the I, I I've, I've sparred with some some people in Lanigan um, groups who are sort of like la, you know lamenting his death and like oh it's it seems so unfair you know the you know there's so much unwritten and conversely man look at his output like at what point is enough enough. Um, we got a tremendous amount of material from him and yeah you know the i i hate that there will you know there won't be any more new records and that we won't see what his you know his outcome uh or his output would have been as a writer um as a fiction writer as a poet as a painter um you know he sent me pictures of some of the the paintings and charcoal drawings that he was doing and they were phenomenal um but also i think as human beings as um as fans of art, we got to recognize that artists are people too. And, uh, we didn't come close to wringing his, his talent dry, but we got so much from him. He was such a gift and he gave us so much for so long. I, it feels to me like the only thing that, that I can say that we can say is thank you. Thank you for having, you know, thank you for him. And thank you for having him as long as we did. You know, the, um, it was so weird getting the news that he had died because, uh, because I couldn't believe that he was still alive for all the shit that he'd lived through. And also that he had lived through all the shit that he had lived through. I felt like he was immortal, that he was just going to, you know, that he would live forever. Um, I don't know. Um, Let me look at a couple more questions here. Uh, Colin uh, said, are there any stories that never made it in the book that you could share with us? Um, It's tricky because, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of stuff that passed between us I know that people who are fans of Marx uh, didn't just love his work. They also loved him. They loved the man. And I'm a fan first. Um, I got to be friends with him and I got to work with him. And that was a great honor. But the um, I feel like my heart is still with the fans because that's how I came to it. Um, so on the one hand, I want to... I wanna, I wanna, I want to tell everything, you know, the, um, Mark sent me a picture of his cock ring. (laughs) It's hilarious that we had fucking ridiculous conversations. You know, the, um, he, he would just, you know, my girlfriend at the time was like, it would catch me giggling on the couch, texting back and forth with him. And, and she, she called him my other girlfriend. She called him Marquina. Oh, are you talking to Marquina? You know, the, cause he and I would just text back and forth and fucking crack each other up. And the, I would love to share that with people because it brought me so much joy. And also those were private conversations and the, you know, I want to like, 
there's like little drips and drops that I, I, I do want to share, um, th that I need to share. And the, but most of that I, I need to sort of, um, you know, protect his wishes of the stuff that he wanted in the book is in the book. Um, the, you know, there were, there were definitely stories of, uh, sort of screaming trees, uh, fighting, battling that I pushed him to, uh, to turn it down, to take it out. Um, we sort of got the, got the vibe of that band, the dynamic between, um, you know, between the four of them very quickly. And, uh, and then some of it just felt like character assassination. And I was like, okay, you know, we get it that you guys didn't get along, you know, the, um, can we sort of like turn that down? And there were some tales of like rock and roll excess where, where the, he wasn't given to that, but there were a couple of things that he wanted to feather in. And I was like, Mark, the, tell me these stories by all means, like, you know, tell somebody those stories, but that's, you know, you know, those nights of carnal triumph there. It's a story for telling your friends. It's not part of your legacy as an artist. Um, the, I did, uh, I did push him to write about Kurt and to write about his relationship with Kurt. He didn't want to write one word about him. And I said, Mark, Kurt was your friend and you loved him for real. And he loved you for real. And it would feel like something was missing if you didn't just talk about your friend, you know, the... Um, so just write about him as you would another friend and know that, that Kurt loved you and that he wanted the best for you and that he would have had faith in you to, to represent him accurately. And that this isn't like necrophilia or grave digging or anything like, you know, grave robbing, anything like that. Um, actually when the book came out, Rolling Stone wanted to put him on the cover and publish uh, a chapter in the magazine, which would have been fucking massive. And Lanigan said no, because the chapter that they wanted to publish was the chapter about Kurt and so mad at him for that. And so disappointed in him. And now I get it. You know, the, um, Kurt was such a huge star that, uh, Lanigan was, was sensitive about that and rightly so. And I, you know, in hindsight, um, I think he made the right call not to, uh, let Rolling Stone publish that chapter because the, the book rose on its own merits. It was good. He knew it was good. We knew it was good. And he didn't want to, he wanted to do the right thing in the right way, you know? Um, Gary said, uh, do you think the Lanigan would have still looked to get back to his previous fairly heavy schedule of basically touring, finishing that tour and completing an album, getting back on the road again? He seemed to be either constantly recording or playing shows pre COVID. Do you think this is what he would have gotten back to in the same way as before the pandemic? Or would he have wanted to concentrate more on writing either prose or poetry or on his painting as he seemed to have found a few alternative outlets for his art? Man, who's to say the Lanigan was really like one of the most productive, one of the hardest working, you know, people in rock and roll. And I, you know, I was stunned with in the span of time it took me to make one record, he would make six and the, and that one record that I made would have so many few listeners, um, I, it seems like black magic that he was able to make so much stuff and have it be of such consistently high quality and, you know, to have it be, I mean, it was really like all over the map. Um, he, which is not to say that he was like some genre hopper or, um, that he didn't know who he was as an artist. He just, he, he claimed a tremendous amount of terrain for himself as an artist, you know, to say, um, yes, I do this too. This is also Mark Lanigan, you know, 
Um, he, you know, he just did what he wanted. Um, I, you know, I think he found a new home in Ireland. I, I do like to think of him, uh, you know, sort of happily growing old there and uh, leaning more into writing and painting and, and stuff like that. Um, but I guess let me say this, that rather than say, I think he would have done this or I think he would have done that, I would say in his art, there were a thousand Mark Lanigans, right? The From Screaming Trees, his early solo stuff, um, his forays into electronic music, um, Bubblegum and Blues Funeral, the, you know, the sort of albums that I love the most. The, um, I think when we, when we think about Mark posthumously, uh, let's welcome all of those Lanigans into our lives, into our heads. Let's think about him getting healthy and getting back out on the road and just like kicking out an album every 14 months, you know, for another 10 years and just, you know, being constantly on the road and like hitting it hard. And, um, and let's also think about him, um, quitting music and just becoming a painter. You know, that's an interesting, um, that's, that's an interesting Lanigan to explore, you know, um, I don't want to say one way or another which way I, I would have, you know, I would think it would have gone. I'm open to all of them. I miss all of them. Um, uh, someone said, amongst his friends, any talk of a tribute show, book, or maybe an album covering his music? Also, any new release of music that fans can anticipate in the near future? Um, the I actually had a dream that I had a green, I had a green '60s Jaguar with a matching headstock, and we were putting together a band, and it was like me and Alan and Shelley, and like we were putting together a band, and it was there was like some big show, and I was so like flattered and thrilled to have been included, and the and I didn't. I didn't know the I didn't know the songs and it was like the show was coming up in a couple of hours and the uh and they provided me with like the chord charts but I don't read music so I was just like I was like this is fucking hopeless you know the but then I was like able to start figuring out and I could figure out okay you know these are the chords those are the chords and the and then I was like looking at my guitar and the the neck was like warping or wilting and the like the neck was broken or the, tr there was no truss rod or something like that. But worse than that, it was like, you know, it was like, uh, you know, fucking an ice cream cone on a hot summer day. And the, and then I woke up and I was like, have you, have you talked to your doctor about erectile dysfunction? Like this isn't a fucking dream about your dead friend who you miss so much. This is a, this is a, a, a different, very specific anxiety that you need to deal with. Um, I haven't been in touch with a lot of other people from Lanigan's camp. The, I've talked to Roberto and Joe Cardamone and, uh, and Ben Schaefer and uh, a couple other people here and there. Um, but I'm sort of the, the literary guy, um, or was the, so I don't know, you know, what's coming up as far as, uh, any new music to be re released or a tribute album or something like that. Um, I think that'd be super cool though. Um, there's another question about the new book, which I think I hopefully already adequately shit on <laughs> the, uh, talking about books. Do you ever think about writing a book about Lanigan? Yes and no. Um, I did when I switched iPhones, I had a weird thought and I actually paid for, this is an interesting story. Um, when Lanigan and I were just starting to get to know each other, um, I think before we were even working on the book, he sent me a phone demo for Ketamine Blues. And I, and it was so fucking awesome. It was, you know, the, um, more than any nude I've ever received in my life. 
to get a demo from your favorite artist that he recorded on his phone where you can hear like the traffic and you can and mark was a shitty guitar player and here it's like sort of stumbling through the guitar parts and hear like his unmistakable voice you know there just um it was phenomenal and and what he was do what he was saying when he sent me that demo was i trust you i trust you to not circulate this so i played it for a couple of people but i never shared it with a soul i didn't send it to a single person and then I changed phones and I paid for some app to like save the entire conversation. Um, and the, I think it saved the texts, but it didn't save any of the pictures or any, or the, or the song, which is the song was what I wanted. And I was, uh, fucking devastated. Um, but then in January, I was out on tour and having a rough go of it. And, um, and I think I was like trying to find where I had saved a set list or notes or something in my phone. And then I came upon the files, documents, you know, whatever, fucking iCloud, I don't know. Um, and there I clicked on something. And the first thing that I found was a voice message from him that I'd saved. And I don't remember what the context was, but it was something like, um, you got to bleed for them. You got to try to bleed for everyone. And I don't know if he was talking about songs or shows or listeners or readers or fans, but in that moment, it felt like he was speaking directly to me about the hole that I was in of like, what, why am I still doing these shows? What do these shows mean? The, um, you know, the, who are these people who, these six people who come to one of my shows in fucking uh, Nashville or whatever. Um, and then I went back and I found uh, the demo for Ketamine Blues. And it had been there the whole time. And it just felt like a weird, I don't know, a turn of the karmic wheel. You know, that I had been, um, I'd been rewarded uh, for not sharing that that it resurfaced in my life, you know? Um, so it's a long way of saying, um, I don't know if I will ever write a book about Lanigan. If I ever write a book about Lanigan, it will be about my Mark Lanigan, my experience with him. It'll be about, because the, because I don't want to. One of the things that Mark was so adamant about is that he was not going to fucking make a buck off his association with Lane or his association with Kurt or whatever. He wanted his his work to stand on its own two feet. Um, my writing stands on its own two feet. That was my connection to Mark. I, I don't feel... Um, I want to share my experience of befriending him and working with him and, and collaborating with him, but I don't want to... Uh, I don't want to scrape that personal relationship for a couple of bucks, you know. Um, I think it's inevitable that I will write something, but I'm I, I'm I, I'm in no hurry to turn it out on the anniversary, the first anniversary of his death, um, and then show for it. You know, I think it'll be something that that will take time. Um, you know, when it comes. Um. Which direction do you think Mark would be going musically if he were around? You think he'd delve deeper into that melancholy goth territory he'd been in since Gargoyle? Uh, yeah, I mean the Mark, uh, you know, Mark loved um, electronic music and uh, goth rock for, um, uh, you, you know, for lack of a better term. The he had a uh, story about. He had a car that Kurt had given him with a push button transmission. And there was a, uh, I think it was a joy division, uh, tape, uh, cassette that had gotten, that had been in the, in the stereo. And then somebody had spilled coffee on it or something so that it was, um, the, it had, it had gotten stuck. So he was just listening to it over and over again. And the, and Mark was too big for this car and he couldn't fit in it and couldn't see out the window and stuff. So the, thinking about this, like thinking about that cassette tape, you know, being distorted, um, sort of like 
Joy Division uh, just sort of circling over and over again. I love that, and I think that that's um, you know a good way of thinking about his music or a lens to, through which to see his music. So I, I think that he would have he would be doing more experimental electronic stuff. I know he loved collaborating with um, Alan Johannes. The but also uh, we were we were hanging out in his garage once, and he was making fun of me for not knowing oh fuck i'm gonna forget the guy's name again uh bobby bland uh for not knowing his music and um and then we started talking about you know old soul music and i i looked at mark and i was like ah, i'm, I'm kind of surprised that you never did like a a soul album you know with horns or something like that and he nodded and he was like the yeah eventually that's gonna happen you know that there will um, he wanted to do this sort of like weirder, eclectic, electronic stuff that maybe alienated some people. And then I think once he had taken that as far as he could, that he would do a huge shift just to fuck with everybody and put out like a soul record. Um, I like thinking about that too. Um, someone said, I hope that Black Phoebe LP, which was in the works, will be released at some point. From what I recall, there were vague indications that a not insignificant amount of recording had been done for it. I really loved that EP, and Shelly has a great white, a great voice for that sort of dark wave stuff. Yeah, I think there's a lot of stuff that's um, that was sort of halfway or in in process. Um, but the best answer I can give on that is I don't know. You know. Um, I don't know what's going on with that. I don't know what happened with that. Um, I have some stuff that he sent me, but you know, again, I'm not gonna, not gonna put that out. I'm not gonna leak that. Um, uh, here's one. Here's another one that I'll answer here. The um, I've always been curious about his mindset on faith. I've got a feeling he had no taste for organized religion, but that final scene in Sing Backwards and Weep, his saying he believes there's a God uh, and that he prayed sometimes, um, forgetting the name of the interview, but it's a fairly popular one and I can find it again. The many references to spiritual imagery in his songs. Did you have any insight into that side of his life from the time you knew him? Uh, yeah, I... Um, I... Uh, Lanigan and I were arguing about sobriety once because I don't drink, but I've been honest about, um, you know, being a vocal proponent of the restorative powers of mushrooms and LSD and DMT. Um, I think the jury is out as far as uh, ketamine and uh, MDMA are concerned. But, um, you know, I asked him how how he stayed sober, how he went to, you know, how he was able to get to sleep at night. And, um, he said that he prayed. Um, I don't think that, uh, I don't think that Lanigan prayed to a, uh, a white male God with a long flowing beard, uh, on a, you know, a, a celestial throne. I think he, um, he probably prayed to something broader, something more universal. Uh, one one of the things that I loved about Lanigan was that he um, uh, he was a man's man. He was a uh, you know he was very masculine. He was a you know swaggering hard ass, um, and the and he was also. Uh, he was a feminist. Let's let's use the F word. The, he believed in um, he believed in supporting the, the the female musicians and writers and artists that he knew. The um, and he treated women equally. <laughs> That's what feminism is all about. It's equal treatment. You know he uh, and I and I think you know in. 
I keep coming back to this this line, which is very sort of like uh, you know freshman college literature 101. The of I am large, I contain multitudes. There was nobody who that is more accurate about when it comes to Lanigan. You know, he was uh, he was a million different people, and they were all Mark Lanigan. Um, but he did um, he did very much you know believe that the women weren't given a fair shake. Um, in general, but specifically in the music industry and the entertainment industry. And the, in particular, he thought that Courtney had, um, uh, you know, had gotten, it had just been abused, um, you know, for, and that it was ridiculous, you know, um, uh, uh this is from Alex. I was always curious about Lanigan's departure from uh, from Queens. He's touched on this in a few interviews, but his responses were always rather cryptic. He was originally kicked out of the band at the same time as Oliveri, but how did he end up back in the band a year later to tour for their 05 album, Lullabies to Paralyze? And how did he end up leaving the band again later that year? Uh, I don't have any inside scoop there. Um... I bands are unstable molecules. I think that um, a band's natural tendency is to to fall apart or to fly apart, um, and that anything can can touch that off. Um, and I guess let me answer your question with a question and say, uh, th- knowing what you know about Lanigan, can you think? about anything or can you uh can you postulate any things that might make people want him to not be in a band with them (laughs) you know at um at his memorial uh josh um told a great story about lanigan uh getting into a fist fight with one of the guys from uh trail of the dead and kicking his ass all the way up and down the alley um, that kind of shit makes for great stories. And if you're on the road with people, um, that can get pretty tiresome pretty quickly. The Joe Cardamone also told a story about doing gigs with Lanigan and doing a gig with Lanigan at some killer venue in Seattle that Lanigan didn't bother showing up for. <laughs> so, you know, the, I guess it's a long way of saying, I don't know. Uh, I knew one more question here and then I'm going to talk a little bit about my stuff and then wrap it up. Uh, do you think that Lanigan knew just how loved and almost revered he was by his fan base? I know that in previous interviews, he had always noted that he had far more success in the UK and Europe than in the States. Hence why he toured there so regularly. Did he ever give any indication that he knew why that was, or did he ever seem perturbed by that? Or was he content with that? He had the appreciation of so many peers in, in the States. It always surprised me that his music didn't seem to resonate as much there generally. The I feel like he and I had uh, conversations uh, <laughs> disparaging Americans, um, you know, basically saying that... Um, the average European is, is smarter than the average American. I don't, I don't know a nice way to say that we're dumber. We are dumber. (laughs) Also guns. The, um, I do feel that your average, uh, punter on the street in the UK has, uh, I don't know, has more of an investment in education or culture or art or a more nuanced sense of humor. The, um, Y'all invested in uh, in education and uh, the NHS, and we put it all into guns. <laughs> so, if you need us to blow shit up, we're here for you. Um, but I, I do, you know, there's a lot of artists, you know, like PJ Harvey and um, other artists that are sort of alternative artists here um, who are just artists in Europe. And, yeah, I mean... I, 
I think he wished that he had uh, a bigger audience here, but I've never spoken to an artist in my life who was like, yes, I have the perfect number of fans. They like me the perfect amount. I don't want any more. I don't want to play any bigger venues or, um, you know, anything like that. I, I think we're all, uh, we stay unfulfilled and that's, you know, how and why we keep producing and the, um, you know, sadly, it's never enough. That said, um, I know that Mark knew that people loved him. Um, I remember my friend, uh, my friend Dave from Vancouver made me a, like a votive candle. Um, or she made two, she made one for me and one for Mark. And it was, you know, a picture of his face, you know, sort of cut out and put on, uh, I don't know if it was Jesus face or something like that. Um, and then with like a little bit of glitter around it and he, uh, and when I gave it to him, he just smiled, you know, and he, and he had a beautiful smile. And I, the, I think he really, he really did cherish his fans and he knew that he had found his people, that he found his tribe, you know, that he was loved and that, um, you know, people, people really did love his music, his art and the, and I think, um, I think in many ways he felt deeply understood. And I think as artists and human beings, that's, uh, that's really what we want. Um, I feel like I should talk a little bit about my sort of journey with, with my grief, uh, over Lanigan, you know, the, I want to say it's hard to believe that he's gone, but also it's hard to believe that he ever existed. Uh, it feels like some crazy fever dream that, you know, you, you find an artist at that time when, when there's a hole in your life and that artist fills that hole perfectly and then, um, and then you get to meet them and then you get to hang out with them and then you become friends and then you fucking work together. And, um, you know, my friendship now with, uh, with, uh, Roberto Bentevena, um, you know, I met him through Mark and our love for Mark and our sadness about losing Mark is one of the things that. I think really paved the way for us to be, to have the level of friendship that we have. I don't know Roberto particularly well. I haven't spent a tremendous amount of time with him, but the, you know, when I texted with him this morning, I said, I love you, you know, um, because I think grief in some ways is a gift because it really splits you open and it really, uh, makes you realize what's important and what's not important and the it's like a thunderclap that then just sort of silences all the all the background noise all the other shit sort of falls away and I think about my I have a neighbor named Oscar I love Oscar Oscar's been a great friend uh it's uh Mexican contractor and Oscar and I get into shit together a lot. The we'll go and buy an, an old truck and fix it up and, and drive it and sell it and sometimes make a couple of bucks. Um, and uh, I had an old Datsun that Oscar had helped me with a little bit. My friend Sam too. And uh, and Mark was like, I love that truck. Never sell that truck. And of course, I sold it. That's what you do. Um, but on, you know, on the day, on the day that Lanigan died, Oscar and I were driving out to Mesa to pick up an old Airstream trailer that I was buying from some, you know, some sort of Arizona lizard family that, that you know, they'd sort of like raised their kids in this trailer and I think they made knives and sold them at craft fairs and stuff. Um, and I have this 1969 Ford F-250. It's just a beast. And uh, 
you know, drove it out there and hooked it up the trailer to the truck and it was pulled it out of this gully. And then we're driving it back and my friend, my friend Kyle Shutt from the sword texted me first to tell me he, how sorry he was about Mark and the, or I think my phone just started like buzzing and like just going off like crazy while I was driving, you know, pulling this trailer. And so I wasn't looking at my phone. And then Kyle's message was the first one that I saw. And then one of the tires went flat on the trailer. And so we had, you know, pulled over at a gas station right away. And, uh, and Ben Schaefer called. And I picked up the phone and... I, you know, Oscar's my friend and, uh, also he's my neighbor. I didn't want to like cry in front of him, but I cried in front of him. I, you know, the, what else can you do? And, um, you know, Ben and I both cried and then, and then I went in and I bought a yellow bandana so that I could fucking dry my eyes. And then I had a two and a half hour drive home and I had to just like, keep it together and drive home and you you know got the trailer home on these like 20 year old rotted tires and just came in the house and fell into bed and just cried and cried and cried for days and the I remember waking up in the middle of the night crying um and I'm struggling to put it into words you know the one of the first times that ketamine like came on the map for me was in the song Ketamine Blues in the, the demo that Lanigan sent to me and then when things you know once when things sort of went bad in my life in November of 2020 um, I was you know flailing around trying to to find a way through it, trying to find a way to get through it. And then a friend of mine suggested I try ketamine. And I think I'm realizing now that I've been off it for whatever, six or eight months completely that I was totally fucking hooked. Uh, and whenever I take mushrooms, I always, uh, I always cry a little bit, like sort of look back on my life and, cry about different things and it's sort of like gentle tears or easy tears there's not, not a lot of like trauma attached to it just like emotion leaving my body and um ketamine was never like that for me and the there were only two times when i cried on ketamine and one was thinking about mark and listening to his music while i was high and thinking about how alienated i was from him um you know, things got pretty bad between the two of us before the book came out. Um, you know, to the extent that, you know, when Joe uh, texted me the other day about a detail from the book, I cracked open the book to find it. And I realized that I've never read Sing Backwards and Weep in its published form. Uh, when that book published, things were sour enough between Mark and I that I couldn't bear to go back and read it. And, uh, and then the other time that I cried on ketamine was after Mark died, I had like, I knew that I had gone off the fucking rails on it and I was trying so hard to, to quit. And I had a little bit left in a bag. And so this is whatever, March of last year. And this is kind of gross, but um, I started doing ketamine August of 2021 and I had this black plate that I cut it up on and I never washed the plate I would just sort of put it away but I always knew that it was there you know and I used that plate again and again and again just cutting lines up on it and then after Mark died I couldn't bear to listen to his music for a couple of weeks and then finally I had a bad night in March and I came home and I went out into the yard and I put on 
put on Old Swan off of uh, Gargoyle. And I scraped up the last of the ketamine into a couple of big lines and fucking railed them both and then let the song play and just sat out in the yard and like cried into my mustache. And... And... And then I got up and came in the house and I washed the plate. And, uh, you know, I think I ended up doing it twice more with, you know, with friends. But that was it for me. Um, And I don't know. I don't know how to how to put it all together feels like I'm not going to say that Mark was my guardian angel or something like that, but the, I learned a lot from him, from his life, from his art, from my friendship with him. And, uh, you know, his absence is acutely felt for all of us, but also, you know, the, I take him with her, I take him with me everywhere I go. Um, and, you know, a year later, I, I feel sadness and grief and I marvel at the, the talent he was and I just feel tremendous gratitude to, to have been alive at the same time as Mark fucking Lanigan. Folks, thank you so much for listening. I know there's uh, a million podcasts out there. We appreciate you uh, you spending your time with us. The um, if you're digging the show, if you're enjoying it, if you if these conversations uh, move you, make you laugh, annoy you, piss you off, um, please take a minute to uh, to rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, It helps us grow the show and it helps other people find it. Um, If you'd like to hear bonus episodes, song demos, just sort of uh, ranting off the cuff uh, conversations, all sorts of different uh, bonus material, writing advice, uh, personal blog posts and stuff like that, uh, go to patreon.com slash Mishka Shabali. Uh, we will be having monthly episodes up there with my mom and I answering, uh, questions from readers and there's all kinds of good stuff there. Uh, thank you so much for supporting.